uh, today we will have an another excellent session and very important for residents and for everyone when it comes to children i think we always most of the time we either we find ourselves helpless or we sometimes we don't do adequate enough that is required for children as well as as well as parents so uh, you know otherwise also end of life care is always a difficult task for many a times for youngsters and especially sometimes a senior people also so for children how should we handle and when they are at the end stage of the disease how what should we do what should be the theory what should be the practical things and what are the experiences of the most most uh, renowned and uh, famous person who is uh, deep into the pediatric palliative care dr marian dr marian mukadan i think it does not need any introduction uh he is basically a radiation oncologist and we used to hear that a radiation oncologist is uh, when i was young that uh, a radiation oncologist is doing wonderful palliative care and uh, she is dr marian she is the founder the new thing jisko batate hain ki she is the founder who has started md palliative medicine in this country with uh, navin and jyota and uh, the md palliative care program is going excellent and successful uh, with dr marian's great effort and tata medical has a dedicated department of palliative medicine again it was her our efforts that she has started this she was a uh, india uh, president of indian association of palliative care and lot of initiatives she has started that time and we are going we are continuing those those initiatives and this really giving lot of fruits to all over country uh she was all, she is not only in india she is a famous person she is also a internationally renowned person and she was a former chairperson of international children's palliative care network so dr marian i think everyone is very uh, uh, eagerly waiting to hear you how we should handle end of life care in children thank you very much for joining us and please start thank you very much thanks everybody good morning uh, for me also it's early so i'm really think thanking everybody for having woken up early to join this and uh, thank you dr shishma for that introduction which i'm not famous i am very very humble person just trying to do some work and i'm just i know that at the end of this one hour you won't say yes i know how to handle children uh, but i'm making a very very earnest request to everybody that when you when a child and their parents walk into the opd and even when they are reaching the end of life make some effort because even though you may be very nervous and worried just have confidence because all of you are in the learning phase all of you have learned already so much and therefore all you need to do is to just hone your skills and then put it into practice because when you're dealing with a child and family they are very happy to have someone who is familiar to them and you will probably be very familiar to them and they may not want to be handed over to someone else so the basic pediatric palliative care i'm sure you have learned from gayatri and you will be i'm sure getting dr lulu's lecture very very soon and this is the last one in the series looking at end of life so let's first of all look at the definition as to what is end of life it's an important this is the this is the uk definition it is an important part of palliative care you all have seen the trajectory slide so you know very well that it's not like we used to say earlier 48 hours but it is that period it could be days it could be weeks it could be months when you when it's clear to us clinicians that this patient is now entering a terminal phase and in this progressive state of decline is when it is become going to be more and more important for us if we to recognize it because we know that this is the last few the time that the family is going to have with the child and it is our imperative duty to make that transition the dignity of that end of life and the dignity of death to be as uh, you know like it should be absolutely as free of suffering as possible so i'm sure you must be thinking oh my goodness is this ever going to be possible but let's just say yes it is possible i mean I, each one of us is going to formulate protocols and uh, you know standards of op standard operating procedure for your own institution you're going to borrow 
from us in india you are going to borrow from friends that we have over the or you know all over the world but ultimately it is important for us to be able to recognize this state but it is also important for us to think that if i can't recognize it and my colleagues in the department can't recognize it let's take the help of whoever we work with so whether it's the oncologist or whether it's the non oncologist is the neurologist or is the cardiologist or is the respiratory person uh, take the decisions together and then it will be much easier for us as a team to be able to recognize that the patient has actually reached that phase where it's progressive and that's when we need to realize that there are so many things that we need to stop doing which we was used to do in the past so some of the common symptoms it's a list and i don't want to read the list but i'm sure those of you who have worked will understand that it's not only pain it is confusion the child is not able to understand as clearly as before what they used to like to do they they become disoriented they are not sure where they are of course they'll recognize their loved ones no doubt about that but they may not recognize who are these doctors who are these nurses they may not be happy in the ward they feel extremely fatigued they used to always want to play but now they can't play anymore they are not willing to take either fluid or solid and the mother is getting more and more up you know uptight because we know that for us in india unless we feed someone we are not doing the right thing they are trying to force their child and the child is not able to take and it's becoming a situation where it's getting more and more psychologically distressing and that's where we need to intervene we know that the pressure is going to be falling we know that the hydration is becoming less and therefore the renal perfusion is going to become less the the heart the bp will become less the uh, the you know respiratory rate will slowly start slowing down and all these are all the things that we need to look at and recognize now i'm not only talking about in the hospital but we are also talking about patients who might be at home there aren't many patients who land up in a hospice so we are going to all the things that i'm telling you that we need to be recognizing is when they come to us or when we go to them so we, i'm wanting you to look at look at patients actually visiting you in the outpatient department or when you are going on home care i'm not really talking so much about recognizing you know like how we do in the ward we do all our five vital signs so i'm not really talking about that they also may not be able to swallow so well so if the if the mother is trying to feed them too fast and they going to start you know aspirating and again common physical to, symptoms at the end of life so we have to you know try and make, slow down have the mother to understand the chest to slow down there will be some places where they suddenly feel good and then suddenly they will deteriorate and of course they might be either incontinence or even retention both of stool and urine and this is again things which need to be recognized but of course like we all know we are all palliative care experts as we all know that it's not only physical signs that we are going to be looking for but we will always look for fear depression and anxiety in the parent and in the child the mother also the the whole family the grandmother the the father the extended family they feel totally helpless and hopeless they just don't know what to do they want they just want to do whatever they can but they are whatever they think that they want to do and need to do it's just not working and the child also starts feeling you know like what where is my life going and uh, we will talk a little bit about the various age groups also so it's please don't think that all these you know fear and depression and anxiety and hopelessness is only in an adolescent even a very young child knows how to recognize that something is wrong but they are not really i think we all know our situation how it is in india we don't really i mean this i'm saying this as a personal observation you may not agree with me but i'm just asking you to think about it how much chance do we give to our patients to the children to actually freely express themselves so are we going to pick up these signs of helplessness hopelessness feeling that what am i you know how much trouble i'm giving to my parents i wish i could not give so much trouble i wish i could play with my siblings mummy is keeping them away from me how much time do we actually spend in trying to elicit the psychological sufferings of the child believe me it's not difficult when we come to how we're going to manage that i think you would have also heard it from gayatri on the first day it's just a question of us finding the time and telling ourselves that i 
I can do this. It's not that I can't do this. I'm not experienced in children's palliative care. Let's have an understanding. It. No, it's a question of developing the rapport with the child and trying to understand even now that we're reaching the end of life, what is the actual psychological issues which the child wants to wants somebody to address. And if, the, if you are taking care of this child, then that somebody is going to be you. Let's also look at the social difficulties. Most of the time they've come from far away. They spent all their money. They don't know now. They feel that because I don't have money, that's why I'm being sent away. The family feels that because there's no money, now they're sending me away. And where also, where should they go? Should they stay in the hospital? Uh, we'll come to that. But these are all the issues, the social issues. Should we send the child home? If we send the child home, who's going to be the person who's going to look after this child? Do I need a trained pediatrician if this child is from a village? Do I need a trained pediatrician? The answer is going to be no. And therefore, no, I'll stay in Tata Hospital. I feel safe there. But the rest of the family is away from them. This child may be wanting to be in the midst of not only the mother or the, or the father. It's not usually both. But they want to be in the midst of the whole family. And this is something which we need to arrange for them. What has happened to the family dynamics? Uh, I, I think many of us have heard this. Though I know not everybody of you is working in cancer. There are many pediatric palliative care is actually more in the non-cancer field. But there is a stigma that huh, this child is contagious and therefore has to be kept away from the rest of the children. And now this child is anyway not being allowed. Now you're end of life. So the child is not being allowed to go to school. So who, uh, and maybe the, the child is not going to be able to play either. So who's the child going to be having to give her or him company? It's the, it's the sibling. But the siblings are being kept away by the mother and father because they think that this whatever the illness is contagious. So these are all things which we need to worry about. The family dynamics, of course, they have spent so much time away from the rest of the family. Now, when we are talking to them and saying that, yes, now your child is reaching end of life, do they want to go back and be in the midst of their family? Because most of our extended families have support system, but in a city like Mumbai, at least for us, they don't have any support system. So these are all the problems. And of course, let's never ever forget the spiritual distress. And it's not only the parents who have that spiritual distress, which is huge. But it's also the child who may be not able to understand what's happening. And we don't know how to ask them, why do you know, what do they feel of the Vaini question? So these are a lot of the kind of distress that patient, the child and the family are handling. And let's look at a little bit in the short time that we have. Let's look at how much we can help. So some very basic principles, like I was telling you a little earlier, it should not be the, the uh, paternalistic medicine that we are so used to practicing. And that is, we tell them what to be done and they do it. I, I, I think we all of us in palliative care, not only for pediatrics, but in the whole of palliative care, we have all heard this many, many times that it should be a shared decision making. And of course, you, it can only be a shared decision making if the family knows what to expect. So when we're talking to the, to the, first we talk to the parents, but then we also have to have the child in some way entering the discussion, depending of course on the age of the child. And I'm basically talking about children who are about say 12 and above, who we need to at least, yes, the decision is by the parents, no doubt. They are the consenting people. But the asset of the child is also important. The child in the ability to understand we need to have had uh, to put some things across to a child. I'm sure you'd have heard from Dr. Gayatri how, you know, patients who lose their hair, for instance, with chemotherapy, they don't want to lose their hair. They don't want to lose their limbs if they have to have an amputation. So in the end of life, the same thing. Do they want to remain in the hospital? Do they want to be taken home? Which becomes it's our responsibility to actually make the home as comfortable as it definitely is in the hospital. When they're in the hospital, they are very happy because the nurses are so kind to them. The doctors are kind to them. At least I'm, I'm sure most of you do that. You know, you keep one side of the ward for them. Family members are allowed, not 10, but at least three to be with the child. So they're very happy. But then when they want to go home, will you be able to give them the same arrangement? So it has to be a shared discussion. What does the child 
want. I'm not saying that we can always give the child what the child wants, but it's nice for us to at least know how the child feels about it. Do they want to go home? Very often when we ask our kids, so, so beta, do you think now you'd like to go home and be with your, with your family? The answer is always yes, because they have that memory of their life when they were well. They feel that my family, my siblings or my friends, my, uh, you know, my extended family, and I would like to go back to that kind of a life. And it's also a problem solving. So now, as I was saying earlier, we're going to re remove all the unnecessary interventions. And some of those interventions probably are, um, you know, uh, oral chemotherapy or anything. I mean, that's only in the, in the, world, in the world of cancer. But whatever interventions are unnecessary, they should be removed slowly. And we have to very regularly keep reviewing. So since I said end of life is days, weeks, and even months, that review will depend on how fast the child is deteriorating. But yes, we have to make sure that we do review as often as we need to review those medications which are going on and make the necessary changes. We talk a little bit about the place of care also because I can tell you that if every child who we have asked, where would you like to be now? And they will say at home because they have that vision, as I told you, of having their friends and being able to play. And if it's possible, then it is our job to make it happen that where they would like to be, we'll try and make it happen. And as I said earlier, we consider the whole family. We need each and every member of our team. You know about team. You know about communication. We'll just talk a little bit about communication with the child. And very, very importantly, we have to, whatever we have decisions which we are making, you know the four principles. I think they're here. You know the principles of the patient autonomy to do good and minimize harm. So very, very importantly for us is when we know that we have not that much of available resources, let me tell you only about our hospital that not in whole of palliative care, not only for children, nobody ever reaches ICU because if they are in the, even if they are in the ward, we make all the efforts in the ward to help the family to decide that yes, they can go home. And if going home is not possible for them, then we have our respite care center where it, you know, there are no, it's not like a hospital. So they can be treated almost like a hospice. And very few patients of us might even reach the hospice. So you're actually following all the principles of ethics. You're removing unnecessary intervention. So you're doing good and you're minimizing harm. You are respecting autonomy because you are always having those discussions. And you are also freeing the beds in the ward and in the ICU, more importantly, so that the patients who are going to be cured are going to be able to do that. And I'll just show you a little further on how many of our patients, what happened to them at the end of life. So again, when we want to achieve this <coughs> good physical control, some general symptoms, uh, some general management again, is we don't want to give IV. We are talking about the fact that we would like this child to go at home, to go home and to be able to be managed at home. So we don't want as far as possible, I, you know, this thing of parental nutrition has become very common now. So, so many patients are put on parental nutrition in the, in the ward when they are there. And then you want, then you have to start having the dialogue as to whether to continue and definitely not, not to start it at all. So it's, it's nutrition, it's hydration, it's antibiotics. These are all things which are as far as possible to be avoided. If you're thinking of sending this child to home or hospice, you can well understand that it's not always going to be possible. So what is the route of administration? If you want to avoid IV, then the thing is that what we need to look at is subcutaneous. But then we also need to remember that there is buccal root, there is rectal root, and of course, in some patients, like for us, at least for, for our cancer patients, the port is already there. So if we anticipate that we might be needing the port for something, then we, then we tell the oncologist that why don't you leave it in and then we might need, we can use it with the help of a local GP. So we should anticipate. Subcutaneous is there for us, but unless you have a syringe driver, it's a little painful for the patients. Because what happens is, as you know, you have to put this, you have to put, not here, sorry, but you know, I mean, it's difficult for me to show. But you know, when you put the, uh, when you put the subcutaneous needle somewhere else on the body, that bleb which forms could be very more painful for children. It's not painful for adults because they have lost that subcutaneous fat. 
but it can be painful for children to have a bleb of 2 cc 3 cc under the under the skin and therefore as far as possible we try to see whether we can avoid that but yes we have used it if you have a syringe driver well and good but i think very very few of us in india have the access to a syringe driver but we also need to make sure that whatever we prescribe to this patient will be carried out so i can't give some very high fi prescription <clears throat> to a patient who is not going to be able to get so i can't say you know give tds uh, iv medication or i can't say give even uh, you know like every four hours subcutaneous um, medication unless i can make sure that this can be done even at home so that prescription which i'm going to make is going to be something which is going to be easy for the family to administer to this child wherever the child is going to be so i think you all you all, you all know how to manage pain so just to a little bit uh, principles that remember that a child who is unconscious or semi conscious will still have pain and therefore whatever pain medication is going on most probably has to be continued it may be, you may re reduce it a little bit but it has to be continued how will we know that an unconscious patient is having pain i think you know it's the same in adults they are very restless they are moving from side to side uh, they may be moaning and that should tell us that you know this child is possibly having pain and therefore we need to give them whatever was the pain medication decided whether it's morphine or it's any of the other drugs on the ladder and of course now we're reaching end of life so the titration has to be much earlier than what you would have said you know given a oral, oral morphine prescription and call the patient back after two weeks you have to titrate it more regularly and this is where you really need the help of some local doctor i'm not saying local pediatrician yes if you have a local pediatrician wonderful but not everybody is going to have that uh, you know that uh, grace of having a local pediatrician but we use the local anybody it it will be a local mbbs doctor it will be a local bh ms or bms doctor sometimes when i speak to the so called doctors i wonder whether they are even doctors but you know if you if you keep in touch with them and you regularly have that phone conversation with them then they are able to do what you guide them to do but you have to make make sure that they are you are able to guide them properly and it's also good to remember that if bladders are becoming full doesn't all happen so much in children but if bladders are becoming full if the bowels are not getting evacuated again it is very uncomfortable for the patient and yes in all this we are doing in the physical symptoms we have to also look at supporting psychologically socially and spiritually that we know i mean this is something which we all do as palliative care people so terminal breathlessness you know how to manage terminal breathlessness in adults it's not at all different so this slide is actually not so much meant for you all but it's meant for pediatricians so you know it's no different in managing terminal breathlessness in adults and in children just use the same techniques if you are using oxygen as far as possible use the nasal prongs but of course we also know that you know it, it it should only be used very judiciously the drugs are the same everything else is the same we just need to have the correct dose which needs to be calculated and in children most of the drugs are always calculated as you have already heard i'm sure by a kg dose so this you decide the dose and then uh, decide how it is going to be administered both these things are equally important okay so now restlessness disorientation confusion very common because they are reaching the end of life they are getting dehydrated there's lots of electrolyte imbalance there would be fever because um, at least in the oncology side a lot of fever is caused by disease now and because they are uh, you know because they have in fever which is inside probably for 24 hours they sweat a lot and they get more dehydrated and there's a lot of chance of the child getting restless and very confused and even delirious so what do they need at this time again let's not think that this is something which none of us can handle parents have to be encouraged to keep the child in a familiar surrounding with people who are familiar to them and that is where the hospital can be actually quite a frightening place because everybody knows how noisy a hospital can be they keep the nurses have to do their job so they keep coming and disturbing the family when just at the time when the child is actually having a real good rest and that is when we have so we have to see whether we can make the environment something which will help the child to feel as safe as possible so we'll treat we'll treat the fever we'll treat 
if there is an infection. But what we need to remember is that that fever is not really being caused by any infection, but it's being caused by the disease process, which is there. So just giving paracetamol is enough. And if required, if required, I mean, um, very often we do use uh, first haloperidol and then diazepam. And it can be given in any which form. So again, I would like to emphasize the fact that we don't use the rectal route enough. And we should really use the rectal route. And we also know about the midazolam spray which comes. And therefore, if at all required, we can use the midaz spray. And continuously supporting the family to understand what's happening and not to get more head up about it. Because then they will start calling this doctor, that doctor, landing up in casualties and all these things are really not going to help them. So that continuous support and explanation to the family so that they don't really land up. So if they understand what's happening, then they will keep their child as in a safe environment with the help. But then the local physician has to be equally there for them to be able to be, you know, to be there. And uh, even during this lockdown, I have to tell you that I've been calling up the uh, the families for the last six months and I, I've talked to so many local physicians and it is it is really very heartening to see how they are willing to rise to the occasion and all these things that we're talking about even not only pain but even for restlessness and, and uh, uh, confusion delirium they have been very happy to actually do what we tell them and then I have then you know when I call one month later I come to know that yes this the child has passed away but passed away at home quite peacefully, sometimes just taken to the local hospital, but not in the ICU. There are hardly any of our kids who have landed up in the ICU. So it's really been very heartening to see that all these symptoms have been managed by the local person, not a pediatrician. You can't always find a pediatrician, but whoever we have, I have been talking to has been extremely cooperative. And I think that's really, really great. Let's not forget the nursing measures. A, a full bladder, a full bowel is very difficult for them. They become more and more restless. And therefore, you know, and you know how children thrash around in the bed and those bed clothes, if they're not kept smooth, we might just land up getting bed sores. So all these important things have to be taken care of. Uh, again, hydration, like I was telling you, the children are not able to feed and the parents feel oh my goodness what's happening and then they try to do all sorts of things including calling someone to put in an IV and stuff like that so a lot of uh, counseling is required but we see as far as possible small 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 sips because most of the patients are able to take it's not that they are in some form of obstruction it's just that they may be in an altered sensorium so little sips by sips or just giving them you know uh, ice or pineapple chunks or anything which is which stimulates the saliva helps uh, you know those little uh, lollipops not sweets because sweets they may swallow but lollipops in their mouth all these things really help and very rarely I mean I, I know it's there in the slide but very 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 rarely I think I, I don't remember in the last so many years really requiring a, a, a infusion for a child. So the mothers are the ones who need to be, you know, helped to understand that, yes, your child was feeding and now my child is not feeding anymore because the child is reaching the end of life and they need that constant support to realize what's going on and not to, that they should not over, try to overhydrate or overfeed. <coughs> and uh, of course, we all know that there's no role of parental, uh, parental nutrition and you just continuously keep supporting the family members. Okay. So again, as I was telling you, there is a subcutaneous route which we can use, but it is uh, it is something which, again, this, I would say, would be a little specialist. And it may be important for us to, you know, to be able to make sure that we have someone who will be able to do it for us. And only then we think of a subcutaneous route. You all know this, so I don't need to go into much detail for that. And yes, there are sometimes, you know, you have a Ewing sarcoma or you have some of the osteosarcoma. Some of them, they suddenly bleed so, uh, you know, so profusely and that can be extremely distressing, not only for the child, but also uh, for the family. And I'm sure you've already had this lecture, so I'm not going into it with great detail. There's not much of difference between what you do for an adult or a child. We just have to make sure that the pressure dressings and using dark towels so that white, you know, uh, cloth getting badly blood stained should not, you know, frighten either the child or the parents. But they must have that little kit over there. So if it's at all possible, if they feel that, the, if we feel, 
that the pressure dressing by you know crushing the thamsogate tablets and putting it in xylocaine and then just doing a very tight pressure we think it's going to help we always tell the family that this is what you need to do and you keep the little kit over there even if it's at home and of course we also know we've seen i mean i've seen quite a few of these hemorrhages they just patient the child just bleeds out and uh, therefore the it's it's a matter of minutes and the family has to be prepared because they need to understand that there's nothing that they can do because they will obviously panic absolutely and start trying to rush the child to the hospital and chances are the child is going to die in the, on the way and that's not very uh, that is absolutely the worst thing to happen so we try we try i'm not saying that he succeed very well but we try to prepare the family that this could happen and this is what you need to do so sedate the child and they need to be you know help not to panic i'm not saying it works but this is something which if you have a yogins or an osteo or any of those type of tumors or even sometimes you have rhabdomyosarcomas in the head and neck area they can suddenly bleed and this needs to be just told to the family again again and again so obviously we are coming to thinking about uh, like we said unnecessary interventions and this is what is labeled as medically futile treatment and this is something which is very 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 tough for us to convince the family that when they were say example on oral chemotherapy because they were you know having uh, we know that pediatric cancers are pretty sensitive to uh, any form of treatment so they most of them whether they are leukemias or they are solid tumors they would be on some form of oral chemotherapy and they have been benefiting up to now but now the tumor starts growing and that's when you have to start having these discussions about medically futile treatment and it's very difficult for fam deaf believe me i'm i'm sure all of you whoever is doing it and there are many of you who are dealing with with children even though you don't have a label of pediatric palliative care you know that how difficult it is to tell parents to stop and it's not only the oncology but it's also the homeopathy and the ayurveda and all these medicines which they start taking and they need to be guided because it doesn't happen in one day they need a series of discussions where they will be uh, you know like and, and of course they will take it anyway so the best thing is to have an open forum for communication because it's good for us to know that if they are giving homeopathy or they are giving ayurveda uh, so that if there's anything you know any of the toxicities are growing then you kind of know where to look as to what's happening so keep the communication channels open but in with those communications help them to understand that you know all these things are not working and therefore they over a period of time they will understand so they'll give say one month and then they will realize that okay there was no benefit the child felt more fatigued not feeding so well they may continue for a second they might even continue for a third but the you know the discussion helps them to understand sometimes they can't and there's those tension start coming up and that's when you need to call in uh somebody else and this is something which we do very often because what we actually then then we deal we talk to the oncologist because we always discuss for us in tata our all these decisions are made anyway in a joint clinic discussion and even at the end of life they the family is as familiar with or more familiar with even the oncologist so we bring them also into the discussion and when the parent hears it from the oncologist it's much easier for them to accept and very very rarely i think at least i know that i don't think in our, in my uh, career in tata we have ever needed to go to a higher um, authority uh, because i think those communication channels are open but just it's there just for you all to know that if things become an impasse then you might need to go to the ethics committee so another difficult one yeah uh, the pain is getting worse the breathlessness is getting worse the delirium is getting worse and there is a role of palliative sedation just like there is in adults but principles are the same drugs are the same uh, again just reminding you that you have to go by the kg dose and you have to continue that continuous uh, communication so that you know the family is understanding because we know that we are following the principle of bubble effect but the family may not understand that and you you know that you you are going to land up you might land up in some situation where you are going to land up so in with litigation so don't just give up and say okay doesn't matter put the child in the icu it's easier for me no continue that communication because like i told you in the beginning and i think we can still uh, arun and myself can still hold our heads up and say that none of our kids have ever reached the icu they have died in the ward 
or they have died in the hospice. Uh, sorry, at home. I'll show you those figures. I, we actually have done. We just did a study and we saw those figures that they have died at home. They have died in uh, in uh, some of them in the hospital. <clears throat> Hardly anybody in the hospice, but dying dying at home. And therefore, this if they have understood this principle of double effect, then they are going to be fine with that. Okay. So now I think I'm also just putting up some guidelines which i would be very very happy uh, i i think you all get this presentation anyway so i would be very very happy i don't like reading slides so i would be happy if you guys would go and look at these papers actually so this is the nice guidelines which tells us how to look after end of life and uh, uh, like this uh, there are there are other uh, guidelines also which so some of them are there for you so like i said i don't like to read slides so you can go and look at this paper about nice guidelines and it really is something which is nice to keep when you're when you're stuck and you don't know what to do then there are these things which you should be able to look up and it should help you in your practice yeah so uh, okay what is yeah so in this paper also they talk about there is a section talking about advanced care planning so i thought that was a good chance for me to discuss like with all of you about the fact that we also need to be thinking when we are having this child in front of us and now it's becoming end of life care we need to be having in advance talking about advanced care planning so this is from that paper but i think even for us we need to have we were not i mean we we are still in that, i think india is still in the process of that form being created um, icmr has got it on its website so there is an advanced care planning form i'm not sure whether it is being used for children but i can tell you that this advanced care planning and some of these things which are put over here we do discuss with the families so who who is going to give the consent who is going to understand what is to be done so we give a letter so what is the summary of the condition we give a letter we have agreed between the family and us and the oncologist what is the approach which we did we try our very 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 best to look at listen to the child's wishes and to maybe even documented there so this is of course i'm not only talking of end of life but i'm talking about when the child is going home then we ring up principals and we ring up teachers and we ask them to allow them to come to school for one hour for two hours so in end of life again you know we have sometimes we have to even uh, talk to neighbors saying that let your child who is a friend of our child you know visit each other so that the child is getting a little bit of someone to come and visit them we have to talk to the to the parents that see don't keep your siblings away from the child so all these things are actually an advanced care plan and though there is no legal uh, support for us till yet till today but just talking about it taking the consent of the family helping them to understand continuous support using the local gp you can have that agreed treatment plans agreed place of care the agreement about what we will do in the life when it's actually when the event is actually taking place will you resuscitate or not are there any sp other specific wishes who's the specialist who's going to coordinate the care so all these things are actually things which we do though we don't really create that document of advanced care plan but we do this for every child who's going away from us and who will ultimately reach end of life and who will die we do this type of a thing so a little bit addressing the psychological distress yes it's it's horrendous let me tell you it is horrendous and it, i wouldn't blame any of you for thinking i'd like to run away from the situation please don't i think they trust you they don't want to be sent to somebody else so as far as possible if you have been handling this child and family from the beginning stick with them because they trust you they have a rapport with you that rapport is so 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 important when they are reaching the end of life and therefore we just got to be there for them we've got to be able to discuss things in as sensitive a manner as you'll be doing it for adults we've got to correct all the fears you know will my child choke to death will my child bleed to death will my child be screaming with pain all these fears that they have we have to keep we have to be there so all these things are not very different from adults we have to be there and we have to discuss those as we were just saying earlier the advanced care plan discuss it put it in the letter so that the physician will be handling it for them because at least for us most of our patients go away they don't stay with us they go home we encourage them to go home that person will be looking after them and we need to if we are actually handling that end of life the patient is dying with us then we need to of course know the cultural and the religious observances of all the religions that we have in our country and we should be helping them 
So again, this is another paper which is just telling us that this is these are the important things which are needed to be looked at in communication. So it's again very very similar to what I have already said. So I'm not going to read that. I, you'll have it with you, but you can see that what we do, I think, is not very different from what even papers are telling us to do. And this is uh, this is uh, another paper which I found, which I thought was very interesting, and so I put it up. Uh, this is there are two papers actually. So one is from I think uh, from Ontario, and one is from the US, which just tells you tells you that if you have specialist pediatric palliative care, that it actually helps with end of life. So what I'm telling you is not that how you need specialist palliative care, but that you are a specialist pediatric palliative care person because you are a palliative care person who is trained. And therefore, when there is specialized pediatric palliative care, they have found that they have been able to reduce the amount, amount of hospital and ICU deaths. And that is exactly what we are looking for for our patients as well. So if, if you are not a specialized pediatric palliative care center, it's fine. You are a palliative care center and you should be able to provide end of life for children so that they can decrease the intensive care admissions. They can die at home or in the ward, but not in the ICU. So that is, I think this is very similar to what we are trying to do. And yes, we, this is another paper. So again, I think we've already spoken to everything that we are doing, I think is reflected in, in the references that we have. And let's not forget that doing this is very stressful and it is important for us to take care of ourselves. We know that. I think we know that in adult palliative care itself, it's very, very stressful to take care of a family uh, when the patient is dying. And yes, it is even more stressful when you're taking care of the family when the child is dying. But there is no doubt that we can do it the best because we have that rapport. And therefore, again, I'm telling you that even though you may not be a specialized pediatric palliative care center, it doesn't matter. If you're taking care of a child who has come to you with a reference because you're a palliative care department, continue with them. Don't send them to someone else because that rapport they have, they have the faith in you because you are from that hospital where they have had faith and they have been treated so well. So continue to work together, support each other because it's, it's stressful. It's very stressful dealing with the child. So it's very, uh, you know, it. the easiest thing maybe would be to say, no, I can't do this anymore. And we have lost. Two people I have lost. And in that is, but this, this is in the last 25 years that I have lost two people. So maybe if you take care of each other, if you have those situations that, you know, you don't land up having a very traumatic death. So if you keep everything ready, like I was telling about the hemorrhage, for instance, you keep everything ready and you counsel the fam family and they know that if you give them if you give them that phone number which they will call of course when something uh, catastrophic happens you should be available so doing all that is something which is it definitely is going to stress us out and we need to realize that and we need to take care of each other and i think it's the same as an adult but as i said you when you're dealing with the parents and dealing with the child themselves you get attached to the child and taking care of our team is more important in pediatric palliative care. So again, the same thing that we were talking about, this is a paper which was written by nurses. So what they did is they did, they did this focus group discussion to understand how they can support themselves. And again, you can see that the personal and sustainable relationship, adequate comfort for the child. This is this paper is actually talking about the fact that when the child is well taken care of, then they are able to come, then they are able to, uh, you know, not feel stressed by themselves. The transition should be, you know, like easy. They shouldn't be, huh, okay, now you're, we are done with you, go and look after the pilot. Okay. So as uh, Arun will reiterate also, we sit in our joint clinics with the oncologist. And we take the decisions together. And that is how it helps to end, to get that relationship going, to enter the rhythm of the family. And the transition becomes much easier. And the people who have actually answered this uh, qualitative questionnaire were doctors, nurses, psychologists, everybody. And they all felt that if everything was better, if the transition was better, if there were better guidelines, if there was better care in the hospitals. Now, I'm sure what they mean by better care in hospitals means that 
everybody didn't, didn't just land in the icu but in the ward itself they were the children were taken care of better and there were better training and policies so i think these are all important lessons for us we also should like so that's what we are doing here we are doing the training but we also need to have probably in all your hospitals better policies for these children who are now dying so i think yeah it's almost i have 15 minutes more so i think i'm almost at the end so let's look at where these children should die where would you I don't want any of us to have it. I'm not saying that we want any of us to have a child who's in terminal phase. But if it was you, I wonder whether um, since I'm not, I can't ask questions. I'm just telling you that myself. I think I would like to choose the home. But if you want to choose the home, then we are going to be able to make sure that the child gets the best, the best possible care for death at home. So I was telling you about this. So this is a paper which was written in 2016, and it is from the UK. So, 45% of those deaths were hospital deaths, but that 45% was actually less than what it was earlier, and the home care deaths were 40%. And this is our data. We look, uh, we looked it up just recently, and we, of course, as I was telling you right from the beginning, hospice for us is hardly ever happens because, as we know, that mother has to care for not only the child but the, the, all the other siblings. and therefore the hospital deaths don't occur as much as the home care deaths do and these home deaths are see let me just reiterate once more that most of our patients don't come from bombay city itself so we are still talking about home deaths in the village or in the town or in mumbai and see our data has shown that 79% of our deaths took place at home so in spite of the fact that we don't have like in the uk that you know the community uh, physicians and the community nurses but we still have caring individuals who can help our children to die at home and i think if we can do this uh, i think that's something which is really good and i would be really happy if all of you who are listening to this lecture would go back and see how you can help your children who you are dealing with to die in the best possible way at home as well so at the actual time of the death Uh, as far as possible we hope that we have prepared the families very well with the appropriate appropriate counseling and communication the place of care has been chosen and don't worry if it changes overnight it's fine because the parents however much you may prepare them they are not going to be able to think straight emotionally and that's where it's important that that local gp is always on the job because then as as the child has still not approached the end of life but is approaching the end of life then those discussions need to start because if they have full faith in the local gp and the local gp is are going to be available or it's us who are going to be available then they won't need to panic and rush to the hospital casualty at the last minute so the place should be chosen and discussed and discussed and discussed and of course if it is there in the hospital as i was telling you the patient is on the last bed with the screen family members are allowed to be there they are not herded out and uh, i and most of us when we go to the ward we kind of make sure that the we have the discussion with the oncologist and with the family that the monitor is going to be switched off and therefore there is no beep beep that the pressure is falling and the pulse is going up because we all know that it's going to happen and if if there is if there is need for oxygen if there is need so if there is no need then the oxygen is taken away and if it is there is need then we'll talk about the nasal prongs so that the communication is there the family members are there and all palliative care patients in a hospital do not get resuscitated so it's a good death and the, of course the best death is at home so in these deaths that we are talking about actually at the time of death no resuscitation family members are allowed to be around peaceful death and then the doctor will just come and certify which is again what happens even in the home because the doctors and the local gp has been prepared that he is going to be giving the death certificate the continuous psychological support and of course we will then help them with the religious religious observances ob observ uh, sorry observances and with the bereavement support bereavement support again is going to be way more difficult because there is more of a chance of maladaptive uh, grieving and uh, you know it will need a way more prolonged care for the family as long as we understand that then we will keep calling them once a month we call them so that we and if at all we need in the city of bombay we will uh, visit them but otherwise it's telephonic bereavement support for the family but we always are very much aware of the fact 
that there is a much higher chance of maladaptive grieving in for with the parents and we have to keep calling them so we do keep calling them and very often when if they are willing then we use them to support other parents if they are willing doesn't happen very often i have to admit because you know they they want to just get away from the situation and move on but if some of them are willing and willing to help us and then we use them to support other families and this is just to say that whatever we have been speaking is not just only our own stuff but american academy and the national guidelines so these are all things which we are using to help us to do what we think is the right ethical thing to do in supporting our patients uh, children and their families for uh, end of life care okay so I, i'll just end by saying that don't think that this is not my job and i can't do it and so i won't do it okay you can do it if the child and family wants you to do it then you please be the person get yourself trained you know i'm not just saying one hour lecture is going to tell you everything you need to know read come and visit spend time with us or there are many other pediatric centers in the country learn but do it but very 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 importantly it has to be a really close team network and each one should be able to take on the other others role the parents are part of that team who is having the shared decision making and those decisions keep changing all the time it's fine we have to keep supporting we have to keep suggesting we have to keep helping them to take the decision and even if it's a wrong decision it's fine we don't tell them i told you so no you know or you know all this you're doing it in adults and we follow the same principles for children and as as you are very well understood that the advanced care planning is crucial here because the parents are so frightened to take care of this child at the end at home but heart of us that's what they want and therefore it becomes our duty to make to um, make it happen and it's also our duty to support the parents and ourselves because all this kind of work is very stressful and we need to see that we don't burn out and that's what we need to do okay so thank you and i am happy in the next 10 minutes to take uh, whatever lecture i mean whatever questions you need to ask thank you Uh, thank you dr marian for giving such an excellent overview of uh, various scenarios in pediatric age group how to handle arun there are a lot of questions can you go one by one yes thank you for the presentation madam uh, first question from radhika kannan she is asking that uh, whether syringe drivers have been banned i don't no, think no, that no. Yeah. No, they're not at all banned. They're very much there, but I think we don't have the experience in using yeah, them. I think we don't have them, not at all. Right. And she's also asking whether, uh, when we want to use subcutaneous route, can we use a scalp vein? Yes. I, I, so, so in the absence of syringe driver, that's exactly what we use. We use the scalp vein set. We uh, take a syringe. We load the number of drugs that you want. Mix it. Uh, give it to the family members and. exactly how much can be in, should be injected in every four hours uh, is told to them and that's what they do uh, uh, okay uh, then there is a comment from uh, sohara gentika so she says that in this pandemic setting what we can only offer during end of life at home is virtual communication uh, the patients pass away with uh, only more family around so far it has not been a problem with her practice and are thankful but of course the doctors want to be with the patient as much as the family wants to be with them so communication goes a long way that's a comment yeah so don't you think all of you who are on this chat i'm sure all of you are doing uh, video chatting with your patients uh, rukmini is nodding her head and i'm sure she's doing it as well i mean it's as good as being in front of the patient isn't it the video chat is as fulfilling to the family and uh, the child as it is to us i mean i chat uh, not, and not only just video chat huh? i chat on the phone even with the kids when the kids want to talk when they're feeling fine they chat with me and i chat with them back so i mean uh, these are all um, i mean we are this we are so lucky that in this pandemic we have so much of communication channels which are open and uh, we should use whatever we can so yeah even the, of course uh, what i'm finding is that it's not it's more in the bigger cities 
and when the children are in the smaller towns and villages okay they can't travel to bombay but they are finding physicians who are willing to take care of them uh, in the in the towns and villages and that's fine because uh, just by talking to the physician on the phone i am able to uh, help them to decide what medication to be to give and if they need morphine for instance they can't get it then they know where to send Uh, so they'll send to that cancer institute, which is not too far away from them. They'll get the morphine and come back and and um, I help them to know how to administer it. Um, well, thank you. Um, then, uh, Doctor Rajeshree, okay, is asking whether you, ma'am, if you can share your experience with. a uh, sibling's reaction to diagnosis and death of a child in the family okay so uh, see i'll tell you how rajesh i'll tell you what we do we have a counselors actually who are trained for pediatric palliative care and uh, though i honestly frankly speaking we don't have that much of experience with the siblings because excepting for the mumbai patients na their siblings will be around most of our siblings are uh, in the village uh, but for those who we are able to deal with we we do ask the you know ask the family members whether we can have access to the siblings and sometimes i'm not saying often but sometimes the siblings are brought and uh, especially when the uh, for those who are from mumbai and when they go to the homes you know when they actually visit the when the home care teams visit the homes of the patients then they have sessions with the uh, with the siblings and uh, i think it's is communicating with the child is the same whether it's the child or it's the siblings we just have to be open and honest and age appropriate so they will ask the most weird questions and one has to be able to answer those weird questions in as human a way as possible no hiding it has to be open and honest communication because really honestly speaking the way we look at grief children look at it so differently my brother is going to die oh so don't don't hide the words don't use euphemisms your brother is going to die but for them oh okay you know they can take it on board they will possibly play may way more with the with their brother because they think that i don't have my brother alone around for much longer so for them death is not as uh, what to say you know it's not as fearful as it is for the parents so you know i think uh, just being factual with them is what we need yes 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 uh, thank you um uh, okay dr kagesh is asking uh, one thing uh, rhabdomyosarcoma of the orbital region in such a case besides addressing pain and swelling mm. uh, and bleeding what uh, what shall we keep in mind uh, share your experiences please rhabdomyosarcoma of the orbital region Yeah, so I think you've got all the three main symptoms. Uh, the other thing, the child might be not very happy that you know the vision is getting lost. Uh, but then again, you know we have to help them to understand how you have the other eye and you can see uh, through that eye because sometimes the radiation might cause a cataract formation and stuff like that. So it's a you know like like I just said to Rajesh, I think children are very okay with uh, handling uh, whatever happens to them. younger children rhabdomyosarcoma is not that much of older children so they can handle it whatever it is so if their vision is going down uh, i think uh, they are okay with that because we are telling them that you have the other eye and i think you covered the three main symptoms uh, body image for an adolescent yes uh, but i guess you know again uh, lots of uh, one on one communication with Uh, the child to be able to understand how can we how can we do the best possible uh, situation to uh, you know to have a, as good a body image as possible which again is important so otherwise what in our paternalistic way of doing things we would not even think of asking the child you know how do you feel about this can i do this for you can i give you a very you know stylish uh, or to say uh, um, Um, you know, more stylish, and still go out and meet your friends and uh, go to a pub. Fine, why not? Okay, thank you. I think uh, we are almost out of time. Seven thirty. Uh, Sushma, madam, could you please uh, conclude the session? Yes, yes. So, uh, Doctor Marian, thank you very much. Uh, you have given an overview of various situations, and you have also given the importance that how we can handle. 
a child at home when pediatrician is there or when pediatrician is not there and you have also given importance of starting a dedicated pediatric palliative care programs i think all these very practical points which dr marian has herself has experienced and with her experience she has given a lot of important points to all of us thank you very much dr marian and thank you all the audience who are early in the morning you are there this shows that it is important to discuss all such topics even if it is in the odd hours of the day you are ready to listen and second thing which is very important that your presence really encourages speakers as well as organizers to have such lectures so thank you very much thank you dr marian thank you uh, audience thank you arun for coordinating so well and thank you nisha for keeping everybody is on track we will see you on next week monday before 6:30 have a nice week and uh, dr marian you will be happy to know that today almost 80 participants have joined early morning and i think this is quite a big number which we don't see in big conferences also in hall we don't see 80 people to listen our lectures so i think it is it was important topic and people have must have appreciated and this these lectures will be on the iapc website so everybody those who have missed can see on the website thank you very much and see you next week before 6:30 thanks a lot